So maybe instead of being able to hold office twice at four years a pop for between four and eight years, let's take away the incentive of trying to get reelected, right? Because when you have that incentive, you're going to do stuff that you think is going to get you votes rather than what you believe is the best thing to do for the country. All right. Dennis, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, you you wear a lot of hats. Uh, you're a libertarian. You're into entrepreneurship, leadership, marketing. Why don't you tell anyone who isn't familiar a little bit a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm a digital marketer. I've been consulting for a long time, and I had a an agency, a full service agency, for a number of years with lots of employees and lots and lots of clients. But what happened, this was maybe seven or eight years ago, something like that. What happened was it was too much for me. I had too many clients. I had too much overhead, too many employees. I didn't have direction and I burned out. So I took a couple of years off to figure out my purpose in life again. I had lost that. I was so focused on making the cash register ring so that I could pay my bills and grow my company. I thought I was going to take over the world, but it it didn't happen. I was so focused on that that I lost my true purpose in life. And so it took some time to get that back to realize that the reason we do what we do is to help people. And in my case, the digital marketing, I like to help people like myself. What does that mean? I like to help entrepreneurs, small businesses, people who want a shot at competing in the free market. And they don't have the same opportunities that much larger corporate entities have. I'll help them too, but that's not my, that's not my preference. I want to help smaller organizations that uh, have enough money to afford the services I offer, but they're not quite there yet. And so by helping them, it feels very purposeful because I'm helping my own community. And that ties into the libertarianism because I really believe in markets. I want people to have the freedom to carve their own path in life, to make their own choices in all the things they do. And to be very forward, one of the ways you have more choices in life is with money. So if I can help people to to make more money with their business while they're also employing people, then I'm doing the work that's required to give people more freedom and flexibility in, in what they choose to do. So that, that's a little bit about me. Maybe we can start with that. What do you think? Yeah, I, the whole libertarian connection to helping small businesses, I'm really curious about because I, I'm not a registered libertarian, but I do find myself aligning with libertarian values a, a bit more. And I have my own thoughts, like I don't really adhere to any party necessarily, but I do feel like small business is incredibly important. Like Amazon, they're going to be doing just fine no matter what. And Walmart, they're going to be doing fine no matter what. And this ties into like COVID and stuff like that. I was warning friends like, hey, we don't want to shut down all these small businesses. They can't go a week without making money. Like these aren't companies that just have millions and millions sitting in an account where they can just pull from whenever they're having a hard time. And how in your mind does that factor in like the idea of small business specifically to libertarianism? I think it factors in significantly. And let me just take a step back and address what you said about the COVID lockdowns. Yeah, that killed small businesses. Uh, Of course, COVID was real. Many people were harmed uh, in many ways. And the problem was that the state in trying to uh, mitigate the issues related to COVID harmed people in so many other ways by instituting various mandates. Uh, I'm in the state of New York. You can imagine what the mandates were like for me. And when it comes to small businesses, they didn't qualify for all of these exceptions to the rule. So Target, Walmart, whoever, they have a small pharmacy in the back of the store, so they get to stay open. But the little clothing shop on Main Street or the little mom and pop deli or whatever, no, they were shut down. They couldn't afford to survive and they were pushed out of business. 
And then what happens is these larger corporate entities are able to capture that market share and you end up with fewer choices. I want to go back to the time when you had more choices. Now, I also recognize human psychology. People tend to like things that are familiar. So, for example, the schema that you would see in a chain like Starbucks is familiar to people. They know they go to any Starbucks, the experience is going to be very similar. They know the drink they want to order. They know what the customer experience is like. It's easy for people. People have to make fewer choices. It's a lower cognitive load. They're going to do that naturally. But consequentially, what happened was all of these mom and pop coffee shops were pushed out of business. So I want to create an environment where at least these small businesses have an opportunity to compete with the much bigger entities. And I think that when I think about libertarianism, I believe there are two main parts to it. One is economic and the other is social. And on the social side of it, it's not just about individual choice, what you do with your own body, but it's also about choices in in society. I want to have the choice to go to a mom and pop shop or to go to Starbucks or to go to both in in different degrees. So that's where the, the libertarianism comes in for me. I can't really resonate with the people that want to go to Starbucks. I'm not a coffee drinker myself, but uh, I think of like restaurants. When I used to travel around the country, I always wanted to go to the the mom and pop's places. I want to go to the place that I can't find at home. Uh, I got mad, not mad, but I I said no to a coworker one time that wanted to go to Chick-fil-A. Like, let's go to Chick-fil-A. I'm like, I can go to Chick-fil-A five minutes from my house. I'd rather go to somewhere I cannot go to. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because when it comes to, I mean, you, you were talking about New York and how the lockdowns were there. And I, there's two, like, if you look at the left and the right and how they look at the police, it was kind of ironic, the police response, because conservatives are generally like very pro police. Um, this is a generalization, but you saw in New York, I remember seeing a video where like a kid and his family were being like kicked out of a restaurant for not having a mask. So they're seeing that, yeah, blindly supporting police, the state isn't really that great of a thing. Even like just because you support them doesn't mean they're going to have your back down the road. And then I you agree. saw. I think that most people, and this is going to sound terrible, uh, I don't believe what many libertarians believe when it comes to people having this inner libertarian within them. I think that most people are naturally authoritarians. Mm. They're happy with all kinds of freedom as long as that freedom supports what they believe in. The really hard part is is having freedom for people who don't share your beliefs. And mm. yeah, it, New York was something else, you know. We we all made choices in in life. Uh Certainly, there's there's a segment of the libertarian community that uh, w- was very, uh, let's say, anti-vax. Okay, I'm not part of that group, but I am a hundred percent anti-mandate. Yeah, and I think we faced a really hard choice when the vaccines came out because they were experimental. We didn't know what what would happen if we took them, and we had to make personal choices and some people chose to take vaccines and some people chose not to. And then the outcomes were uh, potential health outcomes, either positive or negative. You, you have your own risk assessment based on your age and a bunch of other factors. And then other outcomes were the reality of what life was like if you chose to take a vaccine or not. Here in New York, it it didn't feel like a choice because our freedoms were limited. If you didn't have a vaccine passport, which is what I call it, you couldn't go to restaurants, you couldn't go to certain stores, you couldn't do a lot of things because you you didn't agree to have these chemicals put in your body. And and that's a terrible thing. Now, I I understand the fear that comes with a, a pandemic. And I believe oftentimes state actors make decisions based on those fears. And, and it's really, 
it's really sad. Uh, I understand that certainly there are uh, communicable diseases. And if you have a large population, the odds of spreading a disease go, go up, right? You have a crowd of people. Of course, if there are sick people in the crowd, other people will get sick. We, we know that. And, and maybe this is where I diverge a little bit from libertarianism, which is there is a practical side of it. I, I'm, I'm more of a stoic than a libertarian, mm. okay? The practical yeah. side of this is, yes, there are limited medical resources. There's a limited number of hospitals and beds and all of that. And so you have to take, in, take that into account. What do you do if there are more sick people than there are beds? It's, it's a difficult decision. Yeah. So I get what politicians face. I just think they made the wrong decision. They they were uh, way too authoritarian in, in how they approached this issue. Uh, I I was able to tolerate two weeks to flatten the curve. I, I was like, okay, I, I could deal with two weeks, but two weeks turned into two years. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that you think everyone... And I don't want to get you wrong, but you said everyone has a like a little authoritarian in, in them. And I, I actually believe that's true. I think people that are more libertarian minded recognize that in themselves. Like I recognize like I could never go into politics because I I could, but I would have a lot of potential for corruption. It'd be really hard not to treat people I know and care about differently than everybody else. I, I think that's true of most people. It takes a special kind of person to, you know, be even keeled with everything as, as far as distribution of uh, their authority. And then that, that lack of nuance. I mean, you mentioned mandates. You're against mandates, not against the vaccine. And that nuance was completely lacking. And uh, as far as the police were concerned, another thing I noticed is the people on the left that were saying abolish the police were saying we want mandates uh, for masks. And I remember saying to a couple of people, my, if you support mask mandates, you support a police state. There's no getting around that because who enforces it, you know? There's a, there's a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of cognitive dissonance in, in almost every human being. It's, yeah. it's natural. And yeah, the police thing is funny in so many ways. Here, here's another irony of, of police. Um, New York, by policy, sounds like an anti-gun state, but the reality is everybody has a gun. It's just, it's not in your hands. It's in the hands of the state. So you're renting those guns and you're hoping that they are used in a way that you want. But what actually happens in, in many cases, not all cases, right? There are good cops and bad cops, just like every other human cohort. But sometimes bad things happen because the people that uh, we, we give the authority to hold our guns are making some really bad decisions. I, I just saw a video of uh, something that happened in Arizona where there was a domestic dispute and, and that's horrible. And what happened was the wife left the home, the police officer walked in, he had his gun drawn and the, the guy was standing there who was the alleged abuser and he was mm -hmm. holding a gun in his own home and he did yeah. not invite the cop in. And within seconds, the cop shot him dead in his own home because he was holding a gun that he owned legally. That is horrific. So I, I think that there's, there's a lot that needs to be done when it comes to policing and, and how much authority we do give them. And here's the other reality in a place like New York city where I live. Well, I live in a, in a borough, I live in Queens. The police take a long time to get there. They're not actually going to do anything about whatever crime is in progress in most cases. What actually happens is they come and they take a report. That's what actually happens. So, for example, I know of a situation where a, a home was robbed in Queens. 
And the police came and they went through all of the stuff and they took a report for insurance purposes. And that was it. And they didn't catch the burglars or any of that. Like that doesn't actually happen. Uh, in my in my personal life, I had my identity stolen like maybe 10 years ago, something like that. Someone used my identity. They got some store cards in, in a few um, chain stores and they made significant per purchases. Well, I went to the police. I filled out a report because that's what was necessary so that my bank could charge off th those funds. But there was no real investigation because the other side of this that you don't really hear is that a lot of these stores don't actually keep the records of uh, what's what's happening. They don't keep the film of crimes mm. happening in their stores because it's a liability. Yeah. If if one of those stores were to provide the film that shows these people did in fact steal my identity and use it to make purchases in their store, now they're liable for those funds. They have to pay the, the credit card company because they were negligent. Yeah, I think Hollywood gives us this uh, incorrect assumption about like police work. You know, you watch Law and Order or something and they go to a business and the business has footage that they can give to the police and the police can use that footage. And it's like, yeah, that that's not how it works. And then there's tons of crimes that are reported to police and the police look at it as like, we're not going to figure this out. There's no, there's no point in even spending a minute on this. We'll file the report give them what they need. Like in your case, they're, they're just going to give you the report so that you can get your insurance claim or, or however that works. They're not going to do anything after that. Yeah. That, that's what actually happens. Yeah. So when, when it comes to go gun ownership, uh, you could imagine I'm very uh, pro gun, right? If I were a constitutional conservative, I'd say I was pro second amendment. Um, I think that people do have a right to defend themselves and defend their property. Now, I do understand that in uh, highly populous areas, there is a fear that if you have lots of people with guns, that bad things will happen, right? So in New York City, let's say in Times Square, where you have a really dense group of people, yeah, there is a fear that bad things can happen if lots of people have guns compared to, let's say, the middle of Wyoming, where your nearest neighbor is two miles away. Mm -hmm. So I get that fear. I, I think that uh, there needs to be more discussion about the topic, but I, I certainly lean towards um, people being able to defend themselves. I, I think that that's, that's really important, not just against other people, but uh, as a as one of those checks and balances against a, an authoritarian form of governance. Yeah, personally, I I didn't feel comfortable around guns for most of my life, even though I grew up with them a little bit when I was younger. I just the the power of them is just something that I I couldn't reconcile with like having all the time. Like I just they're. I know the gun itself isn't that dangerous, but just being in the hands of a human being who can wield that power can be a dangerous thing. Uh, I have more respect for him now. I'm I'm very pro Second Amendment, and I think people who own guns should try to understand what they own and have a respect for it. And the thing is, you can make them illegal, and people will still get them. Like there's there's like guns all else. over the earth. Yes, yeah. So I don't really, I don't really know if there is, when you restrict guns, you're just restricting them from the people who will follow the law, in my opinion. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's like every other kind of ban, right? You try to ban guns, of course, there's going to be a black market. You try yeah. to ban drugs, of course, there's going to be a black market. And with that black market comes more violence. So imagine if instead of, banning drugs, we said, you know what, let's let's make all drugs legal or decriminalized, whatever, but let's let's absolutely enforce transparency. So now, okay, you want fentanyl, which is a horrible drug for most people. Absolutely horrible. Yeah. Um, 
But imagine if instead of getting it from some guy who got it from the cartel and cut it with a bunch of rat poison and whatever else, which makes it even more dangerous and which makes it uh, include ingredients that you didn't consent to uh, purchasing and using. Imagine if instead you could buy your fentanyl over the counter or your cocaine or whatever else over the counter and, and you, you could at least see, you know what, this, this vendor has some sort of uh, stamp of approval that says, you know what, they met certain standards in how they test the chemical composition of what they sell. And this is a list of ingredients that are in it. And you can look and say, you know what, this looks, this looks better than what I would get from the guy down the street, right? It's, it's not great, but it's a lot better than the alternative. And, and furthermore, when you have when you have these black markets, it, it makes just everything else unsafe. Meaning, yeah. with let's say with with people who use needles, right? You're going to have certain areas of town where people congregate and they're sharing needles and and making the community just awful. Imagine if you had an environment where, like, I believe they do this in Portugal, where people can do all the things they want to do to their own bodies, right? Again, it's horrible, but at least it keeps it separate from people who want to live a normal life, who, who don't want their kids around people who are sharing needles, who want to walk down the street and feel relatively safe. So by legalizing these kinds of things, you reduce the black market and you make things better for, for people who don't partake in them. I, I think it's it's the right move. And, and the last thing I'll say on this is like, there was a town hall in 2016 when Gary Johnson answered a question from a mother of someone who died from a drug overdose. And I voted for Gary Johnson. I thought he was uh, between him, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, hands down, he was the best candidate. I thought he could have handled that question better. I think that when she said, you know, my son died from a fentanyl overdose and therefore we need more laws, the response should have been something like, you know, that it's horrible that your son died. Uh, I don't want that to happen to people. And I'm going to ask a really hard question. Did the law prevent his death? No, the law yeah. did not prevent his death. Banning it did not prevent his death. It happened because he consumed a horrible drug, which probably had other poisons in it because he probably got it on the street. And that's what actually happened. So if we were to uh, change the law and accept that people are going to do what they're going to do, then we can make it a little bit safer. And there might have been a little bit more of a chance that, that he wouldn't have died. Yeah, you can't make drugs completely safe, but you can make it so people are at least aren't getting their drugs mixed up. Like if somebody goes to buy uh, MDMA, they're not having it cut with fentanyl, which is lethal. MDMA is pretty non-lethal in general. Like you can take quite a bit of it and not die. But if, if it's not what you're buying, then you really don't know how to moderate your usage of it. You don't know yeah. how to use it safely if you don't know what you actually have in your hands. So... I agree 100 percent. Again, it, it goes to transparency. Yeah. And, you know, certainly I um, partook a lot when I was much younger. I'm pretty square these days. I have a very boring life. I don't get into any of that. But um, there were times when I am 99.7 percent uh, confident that what I bought in a club or a rave or the street was not what what I thought I was getting. And um, because the effects were unexpected, it wasn't always a, the experience that I wanted at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I've had that happen once or twice too, where it's just, you get something you're expecting. I mean, if you've used that drug before, you're expecting a certain experience and you're like, this isn't, this isn't right. Like something's not right here. And there's no... Some raves I've heard, I've never seen this, but I've heard some raves will like have like testing stations and stuff like that. So you can say, oh, is this what you actually intended to take? And I think that should be 
normal, especially now where like everything is being cut with fentanyl. Like I'm happy. I don't do anything like that anymore just because how risky it is now you get a pill, you really don't know what's in there. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've yeah, seen videos of people. Yeah. I've, I've seen people take touch fentanyl and end up in a seizure, something like that. Yeah. Agree a hundred percent. Um, I saw that same video, the Arizona, the cop shooting the guy. I think I saw it yesterday and it was, it's frustrating because, you know, sure, there was a domestic uh, dispute going on and you look at that and say, well, what rights do the police have to just jump in? Like, at what point is, I mean, because there's this concept of probable cause, like a cop sees something going on and they say, I, I need it to go in because of probable cause. And we just, we give the police so much power in our current country in the country currently and it's just kind of insane that video i didn't like watch it a bunch of times but as far as i could tell that guy did not raise his weapon he was just holding it at his side and i get that like things are intense for police but man it just seems like the there's still a trigger happiness and this is something that i think the left is very it's not that they're correct on but they have validity in what they're saying, what they're irritated about. A hundred percent validity. And in, in that particular situation, the, the threat was no longer the, the, uh, the woman left the home. She was no longer in there. There was no potential threat for yeah. future harm to her. So, at that point, the cop should not have been entering with the intent to to do harm to the uh, alleged abuser. He should have been thinking about how do I de-escalate this situation and and take my report <laughs> so that everybody can get on with their day. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's what should have happened. I, I think we also need to exercise empathy for all parties involved. And that also includes empathy for the officer, okay? Uh, I think what he did was horrible. And I would even go so far as to say he should be prosecuted for, for killing that man in his own home who did not appear to be uh, threatening at all. But regardless, he was in his own home. Yeah. Uh, but I understand when you're in a tense situation, you don't know what to expect. Your adrenaline is going to be pumping and that is going to cause you to react and think differently than you normally would. So uh, I think what that means is we need to look at how cops are trained in order not just to be able to de-escalate a situation, which I think should be the first priority, but also how to address, how to, how to be more self-aware, let's put it that way. So, for example, if I'm a cop and I feel like my heart is racing, I should be able to know because I've had training, you know what, I need to do some breathing exercises or something so that I could slow my heart down and take control of this adrenaline rush that I'm feeling so that I can make a more logical decision rather, what, rather than one that's based on my biology. I, I think we can do that. Yeah. And I mean, you touch on, on that in that video, the woman passes by the cop in the doorway entrance to the house. And I can't remember what she said, something like he's trying to hit me or something like that. And then the cop proceeds in there. And you're absolutely right. The cop should have backed up with the woman and said, oh, OK, like explain to me what's going on. Like the guy's not chasing you out here or anything like that. Like, let's figure it out out here. Call to the guy. Say, hey, will you come out here? Hands up something like that. But it, I mean, there was no warning. It was just, they walk in, see him with a gun, shoot him. And it, it's just, it's wild to see that stuff. I mean, it yeah. makes you really concerned of like, if, well, I think about it. Like if, if somebody knocks on your door at 11, 12, 1 AM, something like that, are you going to go to the door empty handed? Or are you going to grab a weapon, a gun, a bat, at least something? Most people would want to have 
a weapon in hand because who the hell's knocking on your door unexpected at that time of night? You know, you you need to protect yourself. And to think that you can be shot for exercising your right to have a weapon and protect your home and just be vigilant is insane, but a, a very real reality. And sometimes they don't knock. You have this thing called yeah. no-knock raids where yeah. they get a special kind of warrant so that they can enter the premises without announcing themselves. And when you know it, people die often in those circumstances on both sides yeah. because the police have not announced their presence because they want the element of surprise. Okay, I understand the logic. I just disagree with it. But what actually happens is it just becomes very violent and risky for, for all parties. Uh, so, yeah, I, I have significant problems with with how policing is, is done. Now on the flip side of it, I will say that in places like New York, uh, bail reform has been a, a real problem. Now I, I'm not against bail reform, right? I, I don't want people to continually go back into the system. I, I don't want that. I want people to uh, live the best lives they can and be as productive as they can in society. But in New York, you have circumstances where people were uh, committing all kinds of crimes, sometimes violent. And what happens is they get arrested and they get brought to the station for a desk appearance. They sign some paperwork and then they're released. So there was a guy, for example, who had been arrested like 49 times. And he was, he was, um, I think his thing was he had bags of feces and he was slamming them in, in women's faces. Mm. And he was arrested 49 times for this and, and put right back out on the street. Like, that, that's ridiculous. Now, I will say that, that uh, as much as I dislike the policies of, of uh, Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams, um, they at least, at least walked back all of their stupid ideas recently. So I, I hope they're, they're able to do that more. I, I still don't. I don't like them. I don't trust them. I think they have bad ideas. Uh, but at least they recognize that, you know what? Yeah, this is, this is a problem. And the other, the other piece of it that does make it hard is that we have a mental health crisis. And this is another thing that I think most police are not trained to deal with, which is you approach somebody, maybe they're a homeless person or someone else, and they're they're having a mental health crisis. Maybe they're manic or or something, or they're on drugs or something. And the typical response is to to treat them violently when maybe a little bit of training could de-escalate the situation, so that that person can potentially get the help they need. Uh, now this is where I this is where I diverge from libertarianism a little bit, which is that you know we we all want to have a right to do what we want with our own bodies, absolutely, and to to live our lives however we want to, as long as we're not hurting people or taking their stuff or any of that. At the same time, uh, mental illness is a real thing, and I don't know how to solve that problem. All right, so as an authoritarian. Uh, yeah, if you give somebody who's manic a shot of Haldol against their will, chances are they're going to calm down. And if you were to put them in a mental health facility for a couple of weeks, they're probably going to get a lot closer to normal than if you let them continue doing what they're doing. Yeah. I don't know how to solve that problem, right? The libertarian in me says, no, you have to, you can't, you can't force people to do stuff. But then the other side of it is, well, you know, at what point can you objectively say that they're a threat to other people? Or at what point can you objectively say, you know what, their, their life actually would be better if, if they did have some sort of, of treatment? It, it's, what I'm saying is I recognize there are hard problems. And as a libertarian, I also recognize that the idea of liberty can't solve every problem. There's, yeah. there's, some stuff in life that is objective and there's a whole bunch of stuff that is very subjective. Yeah. It seems like the libertarians in general are fairly nuanced in their views or I mean, they're at least willing to engage in each 
conversation and look at the specific situation and try to analyze it. I don't think there are perfect solutions to everything, but there's a lot of nuance there. And then not that the right and left, and I hate talking about right and left because it's kind of a bullcrap dichotomy, but they need each other. And I mean, the way our country was designed, in my opinion, I think politics would be a great position if it were true to what our country was. Like to be a senator or congressman would be awesome if it were what it was meant to be in the, originally. Like you're, it's a philosophy position. You're supposed to be having a conversation and, and really getting into the nuance, like debating things and stuff like that. But now it's just narrative. You have a right narrative, a left narrative, and they're just talking at each other. And then I see libertarians kind of standing there in the middle being like, let's have a conversation. But I feel like it kind of gets lost in all the noise. Like there's just this chatter between the two dichotomy, the dichotomy and libertarians are just standing there wanting to have that nuanced conversation. But honestly, the way that the right and left engage with each other is so hostile and full of clickbait journalism and stuff like that, that the the conversation just goes past that nuanced point of view. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, at the highest level, my personal belief is that the bigger an organization is, the more apt it is to be corrupt, right? When you have uh, let's say you have two people. That's the smallest organization of, of multiple people you can have, right? Two people. If somebody does something corrupt or whatever, uh, it, it's pretty easy to figure out who did it. But then when you have 10 people, you start to get into this diffusion of responsibility, right? So let's say you have 10 cashiers in a, in a supermarket and one of them steals and there are no cameras or any of that stuff. It's hard to figure out which one of the 10 actually did the theft, right? So now you have government with millions of people involved. How easy is it to get lost in the sauce of, of all of that and engage in uh, a, a wide variety of corrupt activities? And, and as a human being, the temptation is there to do that. Like nobody's perfect, right? We all have all of these things in life. We have bills to pay. We uh, in some cases, particularly in government, we have certain uh, ideas that we believe very strongly about. And if it means that, you know, what, if, I, if I'm just a little bit corrupt, I can make a whole bunch of money or I can uh, forward the idea that I believe in, well, why not? The cost is relatively low and, and the reward is relatively high. So, yeah, I'll probably do it because I'm a human being. That's, that's what human yeah. beings do. So when you have a big government, you create an environment that brings out, in my opinion, the worst in people. And, and that's why I like small business, too. Same, it's same thing with you have a transnational corporation, a huge organization with lots of moving parts. Of course, there are going to be people who are, are corrupt in that organization. Just play the numbers. It's going to happen. And now, now transfer that to governance, and you have all of these other incentives for uh, corrupt behavior and for party politics, which is what you were talking about. So the incentive is, yeah, let's just continue this culture war and pin two sides against each other, right? This is, this is really basic stuff, divide and rule, and we get all of the peons to fight with each other while we extract wealth from both sides. Yeah. So you could take an issue like, let's say, uh, abortion, right? Each side has its its stance on on what to do about it or or not to do about it, and there is no incentive to actually solve the problem. The only incentive is to keep it as a wedge issue because of how politics operates. You keep it as a wedge issue, you drive millions, sometimes billions of dollars in in donations. You maintain your power. You keep people angry so they keep donating and supporting and and voting for you. Right. That's that's what actually happens. Nobody's there to solve problems. Yeah. And so that's that's another reason why I like the idea of libertarianism, because we realize, you know, what we all have 
different ideas about life. We all have a different moral compass that we follow. So let's go down to the most fundamental thing that we can all, or that most people would agree on, right? The most basic thing is don't, don't commit violence against people. Don't hurt people. Don't coerce people. Don't commit fraud. Um, and don't steal from people. Right? In a modern society, that's, that's the essence of, of morality. And then you get into all these other things that have a lot more nuance to them. Uh, if we could get closer to that, I, I think we'd be in a better place. Yeah, that with the corruption of a large entity, that chain of command and the levels of management is another incentive to cover up wrongdoing and corruption because no one wants to bring bad news to their manager or their boss. So the more bosses, the more levels you have there, and this goes for like military and stuff like that. I think this is why a lot of, you know, like uh, I think in the early 2000s, you had like the sexual assault uh, stuff going on in the uh, in the military. And I think the reason no one knows about it and then all of a sudden everyone knows about it is because the, at all these different levels, people are trying to like end it right there. Like let's keep it from going up any higher because I don't want to piss off my boss and he doesn't want to piss off his boss. And Yeah, that's accurate. That and, you know, there's another piece to it too, which is that, we're all part of different communities yeah. and it is a um, it is a human behavior to want to protect your community, right? At the biological level, you want to protect your genes. And at, at the national level, we essentially see uh, whatever groups we're in as our extended community. So if you're if you're working at a company or in a department or if you're in government or you work or you're of one party or another, your incentive naturally is to protect your community, protect the Democrats, protect the Republicans, protect the people I work with, because that's my family. So I, I think that we have to look at this realistically and say, you know what, that is, that is human behavior. So the only way to address it is to change the system. And the only system that would actually address it is one where uh, you don't create an environment where it's super easy to be corrupt. Uh, it's now that said, the challenge is that the people in power are the ones who make the decisions on the system that we have, and it's not in their interest to to change it. So, for example, a lot of people advocate for ranked choice voting, which I think is an awesome idea, right? So, ranked choice voting. You can pick your you can pick your first choice and not be worried about the quote unquote spoiler effect because you're so called taking votes away from the lesser of two evils. It's it's a wonderful idea, but for it to be implemented, it requires people who already have power to cede that power to say, you know what? Right now, I have a a duopoly. I've only got one real competitor in in my election. It's the other party. If I go for this ranked choice stuff, now I've got all of these third parties that I have to compete with. Uh, why would I do that? Right? Pragmatically, it doesn't make sense. Um, so, so again, there are solutions to these problems. The question is, how do you implement these solutions knowing that the people in power don't want them? Yeah, it's like the fox garden, the hen house kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, the people who need to make things better are the ones incentivized not to like they're the ones that benefit from not fixing it. And you see that with uh term limits too. Um, and I've talked to a couple libertarian presidential candidates and uh, both of them have term limits on their agenda, but it's like, what can you do as president? I mean, you're not going to be able to pressure Congress to make that move. I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's realistic to, Assume that you one person can pressure an entity of I don't know five hundred something people. I just don't see it happening. Yeah, it's it's not an easy thing. Now, now what I will say in their favor is that yes, if you can figure out how to change culture, culture can create pressure where uh, people in power know that if they don't give in to what their constituents want then they will lose power. 
So that, that's how you would do it. Uh, the question is, how do you create enough pressure in order to actually make that happen? That, that requires yeah. a lot. And the odds aren't in our favor. I have a question. Um, maybe you know this. I've, I've just heard it from friends, but I've heard that if libertarians or another third party get more than 5% of the vote in a presidential election, that they get some funds uh, sent their way. Is that correct? And who would those funds it's, be from? It's accurate. Yeah. Um, so th there, there's a lot to this. There, there are libertarians who are purists and say, well, if that happens, we don't want to take it because it's state money. Well, okay, but you're participating in a state system. You're participating in an election. And if that money doesn't go to you, it's going to go to someone else. Why wouldn't you take it? Right. Yeah. So that that's one piece of it. Uh, yeah, I think that if a libertarian were to get the five percent and they were to get um, everything that that comes with it, they should take it. Now, here's the other piece of it, though. If you look at what happened in New York, I, I know we were talking about this off camera. In 2022, they changed the rules for ballot access and knocked uh, a candidate off the ballot. So I. I was the campaign manager for Larry Sharp, who was the gubernatorial candidate for the Libertarian Party in New York, 2018, 2022. In 2018, he qualified for automatic ballot access in 2022. He got 95,000 votes. The requirement was like 45,000. But they changed the rules retroactively to increase the requirement from 45,000 to something like 2% of the vote or something like 130,000 people. And they knocked him off the ballot with a rule change. So here's the thing. Let's say a libertarian does get that 5%. Why wouldn't the people in power just implement a rule change and increase that to 10% or whatever number they know that their people are likely to achieve, but our people are not? I, I think that's what would actually happen. But that's what they did with uh, Ross Perot and getting on the debate yeah. stage, right? After with he the did debates. it, now it's fifteen percent, and now no one can get on because fifteen percent is really, really difficult to get if your name isn't even being included in the polls, and you don't have any cho you don't have any say in which polls get included. So you might get you might poll at twenty percent in five polls, and they're like. Well, only two of those polls count as the polls we are going to include. So, I mean, the system is absolutely rigged and it's not rigged for, there's probably some rigging for Democrats and Republicans against each other. I mean, I'm sure there is, but it's mostly rigged just to keep those two parties in power. And yeah. that brings me yeah. to another question is if, Libertarians or a third party can get 5% and get federal funds or, or public funds for their campaigns. Does that mean every year public funds are going to Democrats and Republicans? I'm pretty sure that's exactly what that means. Yeah. That, so I find the people that outrageous. in power are getting free tax money from all of us to keep them in power. Yeah, that's what happens. I find that disgusting. Like it's disturbing, horrible. really. Yeah, it's it's horrible. <laughs> uh, and, and so again, that goes to the argument, the libertarian argument that you know what, let's let's minimize the state as much as we can. Let's get as much money out of politics as we can. Right? It, it would be better that way. the The challenge, of course, is that's not the system that we have today. So yeah, if if you're if you've got cash, right? Like there's. Um, you know, among libertarians, Lars Mapstead has cash. He should use it 100%. And if he can get into some polls because he can spend $50,000 to get into a poll, he should do it. I'd like to get to a place where we don't have to do that. Yeah. Uh, now, now, all that said, I, I think RFK has got a shot at getting into the debates. But here's the other piece of it. Are the other people going to show up? Okay. Yeah. So in 2022, um, oh no, I, I, I'm sorry, 2018, again, like Larry Sharp got into uh, a debate in New York 
I think this was with the uh, League of Women Voters. I might have said that wrong. But they hosted a debate. They invited all of the candidates. And he and the Republican showed up, uh, Mark Molinaro. Andrew Cuomo didn't show up for the Hmm. debate. He didn't show up. So what does that mean? It means that the debate didn't get the media exposure that it would have gotten had he actually shown up. So even if a guy like RFK gets into the debates, the odds of Biden showing up, the odds of Trump showing up, they're pretty low. They yeah. have to know that by showing up, they, they actually get something out of it. And you saw this in the, um, in the Republican Party when Donald Trump didn't show up to all those debates. He didn't need to because what he realized and he was right about this was that he stood to lose more than he would gain. He already has a, a big following. Why would he give a piece of that to some other candidates? It makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, from a practical standpoint, it made no sense for him to go to the debates because I mean, they had, I don't know, 10, 12 people on the debate stage at one point. And I, I pay attention to politics. I didn't even know half those names. And it's like, why, why would you go as the person who has the most support? Why would you go and debate people who nobody knows? You're just, you're boosting their name more than yours. And honestly, most people, a lot of people look at those debates, the Republican ones as Trump won the debate still without even being there. Like he was still the center of focus that most people talked about. Like, his name was probably said more than any other candidate in the Republican group. And it's, it does make sense from a strategic standpoint for him not to go, but it is, it's unfortunate that that's the case where we can't just have a debate where we can't have honest debates. And part of that I think is who controls the debates. It's Fox, it's CNN, MSNBC or NBC it's the same outlets that we can't trust with our information in the first place. Like we can't trust these companies. We know they won't allow talking about uh, the pharmaceutical industry and uh, many other topics, but somehow we trust them with holding a debate for the highest office in the country. I think we should decentralize that as well. Yeah, I I agree with you. And and I will also say that Every organization has bias. Every media outlet, every podcaster, everybody has bias. And so the best thing an individual can do uh, is to try to consume media from across the spectrum. And then whatever overlaps is probably closer to the truth than, than the stuff that's outside of that, you know, those overlapping circles in the Venn diagram. Now, the the other interesting thing though is with with outlets like Fox and CNN the average person might say well Fox is more right leaning and maybe maybe not so much now but let's say Fox is more right leaning CNN is more left leaning something like that but from a libertarian perspective both of those organizations are what we would call statist mm-hmm. what yeah. they're leaning is is in keeping the power at the state level. So in both cases, you're not getting this message of liberty, which is to limit state power. It doesn't happen. Uh, thankfully, you can get that message from lots of podcasts like this one, I, I think. Um, and that, that's a good thing. But this also goes back to human behavior. Most people, they don't want to invest the energy into learning all of these different opinions and policies and perspectives and all of these things. Most people have other things to do in their lives that take priority. So from a political perspective, the question is, how, how do you capture people's attention? And, and I think that's what leads to this culture war that makes people angry, right? Getting people angry is a great way to capture their attention. Uh, it's, it's not as attention getting to, to be a moderate quote unquote moderate and say, here's a, here's an actual solution to the problem. Like people don't pay attention to that because it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, r- release all of those neurotransmitters that, that, uh, an angry conversation would release. Yeah. And people want to identify with a party or a group community. I hate the word community in certain senses because many times 
in politics, at least when the word community is thrown around, it's usually not a community. It's a political grouping. Like, Correct. Um, and I don't, I might get in a lot of trouble for this, but LGBTQ, that community, it's not an actual community when it's talked about politically. Correct. It's just so somebody in politics can talk about all those people without treating them as individuals. Well, not just that, but it's not just so they can talk about them. It's so they could take advantage of them. Yeah. Right. So like, like it, as a, as a libertarian, I don't care what you do with your own body. It's your choice. Like live your life and be happy. Yeah. Um, and when I look at people using LGBTQ plus community, right, there are some people who do it out of fear because if they don't say the right words, people will judge them as, as being uh, anti-gay or anti-trans or whatever. And then there are some people who use it in order to take advantage of people, right, to virtue signal, whatever else. Um, and then there are people who are true believers. And, and those are the people that I, I'm most uh, empathic with, where there are people who really believe that, that these politicians, these people in power, have their best interests in mind. And, and that is so far from the truth. And I'll say one more thing with, with yeah. that, too, which yeah. is like, you're also grouping a lot of different kinds of people together. Uh, so, for example, there are there are gay people who um, don't necessarily, uh, you know, whether you agree or disagree, they don't want to be lumped together with trans people. Right. They're, they're different things. And so now you're you're creating this artificial framework that says, no, you have to be grouped with these people. It, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting thing. Yeah. It, it touches on, I mean, same thing with the party, right? Like if you're, if you're a Democrat, you just support everything Democrats support. It doesn't leave the nuance for you to be like, well, I support this and this and this, the Democrats support, but I'm not a Democrat in these regards. But that, that nuance is, removed when you uh when you accept a label of anything any any kind of group label whether it be democrat republican or a community that somebody's putting you in and that includes like racial communities people want to say oh the black community or people usually don't say white community too much but black community hispanic latino community which is kind of ridiculous in a certain sense because i mean latino is or Hispanic is grouping Puerto Cubans Ricans with Mexicans. Yeah. 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 Like, mm. and, and from my understanding, there's often like uh, squabbles between like Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, stuff like that. Like different, there's different groups within that group that don't see eye to eye necessarily. And then again, everyone's an individual and you can be Puerto Rican and diverged quite differently from another Puerto Rican just because like, it's all about superficial characteristics, right? Like it's like, Oh, your skin color is this, or your native country is this, like your, you know, your ancestral country is this. So you should think this. And it's like, no, everyone's an individual. Everyone has the right to be an individual. And I think it's just, lumping people together so that they can wield a certain power by saying, Hey, this community feels this way instead of treating them as an individual. Let's just talk about them as a community, which if you're talking about race is kind of racist. I mean, and if you're talking about any other group, it's, it's just, it's wrong in my opinion. Yeah. I, I agree with all of that. I will push back a little bit and this is going to, in some people's eyes, it's going to make me sound like a progressive, which I'm not. Okay, uh, I do think that that culture is an important thing. I think that uh, if you're Italian or Irish or Vietnamese or whatever, uh, there are certain cultural things that are tied to um, how you grew up, and 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 certainly, uh, you know, from an from an ethnic perspective, more people of, of your background are going to participate in these things. And I think that's wonderful. I think you should 
celebrate your culture. Um, now, here, here's an interesting thing that, that I learned, which is, you know, you talk about, well, why is it that um, black people can celebrate black culture, but white people can't celebrate white culture, right? It's politically incorrect. There's a pretty simple answer to that. Now, you don't have to agree with it, but it's important to understand it. Right. The understanding is, you know what, if you're if you're Irish or English or whatever else, nobody's going to give you a hard time if, if you celebrate your Irish culture on St. Patty's Day or whatever. Nobody's going to give you a hard time if you have uh, an Italian-American business group where you're supporting your community. No one's going to call you racist for that. The difference with with black people being able to have a black culture versus white people having a white culture is that is that those people who are descendants of slaves had their culture taken away from them. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could try 23 and me. Maybe it's accurate to figure out where you came from. But most people don't know what country they came from. They don't know what their culture was. They didn't get a chance to. um participate in a lot of these cultural activities. And so a new culture was created for, for black Americans. And that's the reason why it, it's politically correct to, to use that terminology, but not necessarily for, for white people. Again, you disagree with it, but being able to understand it, I, I think is important. Yeah, no, I agree with everything you said. And I think there's a big difference between how somebody personally identifies themselves. Like if, if, if somebody identifies with black culture, that's fine. It's the problem comes when somebody else tries to determine whether somebody is part of a certain community. Yeah, they put it, you in a box. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's same for like, you know, I'm part Italian. Like I, I like, Italian culture. I love Italian food. Um, it's doesn't love me all the time, but I, I think it's great to celebrate your heritage and, you know, if somebody identifies with black culture and a black community or black American. I don't know exactly what the right way to put that would be, but I think that's great that they embrace that. I just think that when politicians talk about the black community or the Irish community or the Italian community, it they're they're stripping people of their individ individuality at that point. Because yeah, I agree they're, 100%. Not, they're not talking about the nuances of that culture. They're just saying, I want to talk about this group and make it sound like they support this or that cause, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If if you don't vote for Joe Biden, you ain't black. <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah you Which know is... the other the other piece of this too is is i try to view the world from the perspective that that oftentimes people do have good intentions and so for example uh you talk about the dei diversity equity and inclusion right there are there are many well-intentioned people who want who advocate for dei the problem is in the execution Right. So now we can say, well, you know what? It's accurate to say that certain groups had their rights taken away from them by the government historically and that had certain consequences. So slavery and then Jim Crow led to uh, black people having less wealth in their communities or sometimes having their wealth taken away from them. Uh, being redlined to certain districts and that kind of thing. Is, is there a way that the state can can right that wrong in some way? Maybe. I don't know. Um, one of the ways that, that people are trying to right that wrong is, is through DEI. And, and so I understand the logic behind it. Uh, and I'm open to ways to implement it voluntarily at the company level, not at the state level. Uh, where maybe it can do some good. Uh, now, that all said, I think that oftentimes it, it harms the people it's trying to help. So, for example, there is this trope that if you are of uh, uh, any variety of, of minority groups and you get into an Ivy League school like Harvard, you got there because of racial quotas. And maybe that's true for some people. 
but it's not true for everyone. But the way that people read it oftentimes is, yeah, that person got into this school because of what they look like, because of what they wrote on their application. And so that does harm to people who this policy is, is trying to help. Or, you know, the flip side of it, again, take a school like Harvard, where their DEI policies, they wanted to get more black and, and Latino people into the school. And consequently, they had to reject a lot of Asian people. So th this idea that they were helping one group harmed another group. And, and again, you know, how do you, how do you solve that? I, I don't have all the answers. Nobody does. Yeah. I, I think we just have to understand that people often have well, often have good intentions in governance, but the outcomes are disastrous. And so again, Let's minimize what the government does. Let's let companies decide what their own DEI policies or not happen to be and let them compete in the free market. And my guess is that companies that that explore diversity, not just in how people look, but in how they think, those companies are probably going to do well in the free market. Yeah, I generally agree with that. And you're right. It's not an easy thing because. I think some conservatives want to act like, well, everything's even now. They're, the laws are equal. We've, we've reached equality. And legally, that might be true. We might have pretty much gotten to equality in a legal sense. But it, it, there is some historic injustices that they have generational repercussions um, for people. And, and this is specifically... Uh, black Americans and uh, indigenous people. I mean, the, those two groups specifically have had a lot of negative repercussions that have trickled over generations. It doesn't mean that every person in those groups is, you know, poor or anything like that. Definitely there's uh, individual success, but it does mean there has been some, and it I mean, you can call it systemic racism. Um, I do believe systemic racism is a thing. Conservatives tend to disagree with that concept, and it, it goes back to the nuance of it. It You can have a nuanced conversation without this black and white, it doesn't exist or it does exist. Like There's a middle ground where where there's room for actual discussion, but... That's not our political atmosphere right now. The political atmosphere is to just go full steam in one direction or the other. I, I think the other piece of it, too, is that most people are programmed to try to persuade. And, and when they can't persuade, they get angry. And so they want to be authoritarians and force people to, to do what, what they think is the right thing. I, I don't approach conversations that way. Uh, I approach conversations from the perspective of, you know what, I don't think I'm going to change your mind, but I can at least show you uh, why I think a certain way or why other people think a certain way from my perspective so that when you make your own decisions, you're at least a little bit more informed. That's all. And the reality is that when you when you try to push people, right, this is sales 101. If, if you try to force somebody to buy your car, they're not going to buy it, right? They're going to do the opposite of that. They're going to go to somebody else. You have to be able to communicate with people. And if, if you actually want to be persuasive, then, then really you want people to arrive at, at their own conclusions based on the information that, that they receive. So if we could figure out how to do that, yeah, I, I think we'd be in a better spot. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't try to be too persuasive in any regard too much. I, I like to ask questions. I'm just curious. I, I really want to understand how people think. And I can have a conversation where I agree with somebody. I agree with a lot of what you're saying today. But if I, I one of the things I look at is like, I couldn't, I've been thinking about this a little bit lately. I couldn't have a diehard Trump supporter who's well-informed on the opposite end of this conversation and really 
push back to a great degree on a lot of their claims because I just, it's not an area of like strong competence for me. But likewise, I couldn't have a, a Biden supporter who is competent and well informed. And I couldn't push back on what they're saying. I would m- be much better equipped to have a conversation where I'm asking both of them questions in the same room. Like that would be the atmosphere that I would thrive in better. I'm not, I'm not here to be an arbiter of truth because I don't know, I don't know what the truth is in every regard or most regards. And I, a big part of the podcast is accepting that, accepting that, Hey, I don't know everything I want to learn. And I have to learn by talking to people I disagree with and uh, I might disagree with them incorrectly sometimes. And I just have to accept that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And and here's the funny thing is uh, I don't believe that objective reality exists. I don't believe that objective truth exists. I, I think that, you know, we see the world through the filter of our mind, right? We've got all of these atoms and molecules that surround us, most of it is empty space, but our minds will, will create the illusion that, that this desk in front of me is solid, but it's not, it's mostly empty space. Yeah. So if you look at the world from that perspective, you realize that, that you know, seven, eight billion people in the world see the world seven or eight billion different ways. Uh, some of those are compatible with how you see it and, and some aren't. So the best you can do is accept that um, people live in different realities, right? A Trump voter is going to live in a different reality than a Biden voter is going to live in a different reality than, than you or me. Um, I guess that's how the world works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The not believing in objective reality is interesting because I believe there are a lot of instances where there is not an objective reality, but I can think of some where I'm like, yeah, I think something is objectively true in some regards. Like one extreme one, uh, and I'm just thinking back to an earlier episode that didn't get released of this podcast. Somebody mentioned the concept of rape and like, I, I believe rape is just wrong. Like, like forcible rape where somebody is just has been raped. It's like, I can't accept any explanation where like, Oh, well it was okay in their mind. So it, it, you know, you just don't understand what's going in their mind. Right. Like I, I think that it's objectively true that something like that is bad, but I well, do let agree. Me give me the other side of it. If yeah, I yeah, may. Please. So, so first of all, yes, uh, I also believe that that rape is a horrible thing, and that anybody who does such a thing should be punished to the full extent of the law. Full stop. Yeah. Historically, has it always been a, a a horrible thing? Well, if you look at if you go way back in human history when we were hunter gatherers and you had different tribes, what happened? Uh, the tribes would fight and the winning tribe would, would take all the property and all of the women of the other tribe because biologically their goal was to um, increase their gene pool, right? That's as animals, that's what we do. Uh, is that immoral? In a modern society? Yeah, that's immoral. Was it immoral, I don't know, 20, 30,000 years ago? I don't think people would have seen it that way. They saw the world through a different lens. What I do believe is that morality changes as a society advances. So uh, you look at the culture that we live in. We 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 don't have to do all of these violent things. We don't have to steal from people in order to to survive in our capitalist system. You just go out and get a job, and and you can you can do stuff. Um because our society has advanced to that point. But there are societies that are not at that level. And you can look at other species too, right? Like like chimpanzees. Chimps will steal from each other and and they don't see that as immoral. They need to feed themselves. Or you could look at, for example, let's say you're an impoverished 
father, right? So, so theft, yeah, I think it's wrong. You shouldn't steal from people. But if you have no money and you've got a kid to feed and you know that if you don't steal from somebody, your child will die, is it immoral to steal? Not from his perspective. So I, I do think that even in the worst circumstances, like rape, which is a horrible thing, an argument can be made where culturally it would have been seen as something that was not immoral. Again, going back to the days of hunter gatherers. Yeah, I, I, I guess you have a point there. It's just, I think when, you know, when in our modern age, it's hard to, it's hard to accept sometimes that things used to be quite different, you know, and then not, too distant past, you know, 30,000 years and on the grand scale of things is pretty recent, actually. But it, it's hard to swallow that sometimes, right? Like, hey, yeah, things used to be quite different a couple thousand years ago. Yeah. But in, like, in modern age, like, if, is there any culture on, I mean, is there any rape that can happen in the modern age and be not immoral? Like, Again, is there an objective it, it reality for this perspective time? perspective of the person and the culture that they're in, right? From my perspective, yes, all rape is immoral, 100%. Can I understand why someone in a uh, country where they are totally fine with child brides can I understand why they think that it's not immoral? Yeah, I think it's horrible, but I understand why, because that's their culture and culture is subjective. Yeah, there is a lot of subjectivity to culture. It is really interesting. I think we've, we are where we are and we're so used to how things are that it, it gets hard to imagine things being differently, especially in the West. Like we've, We've had a, a certain culture for so long that we forget that not everyone agrees with us. And it's it's one of the funny things when we try to uh yeah, I'm I'm a non interventionist in general. I don't I don't like war. You know, war creates a lot of rape and a lot of criminality on uh even the side that you often think is good. Uh there's a lot of bad things that tend to happen. hundred percent. But you you look at how we try to, um, in the U.S., we say we're giving this country democracy. We're going there to instill democracy. And it's like we're trying to force people into a political atmosphere that they have no appetite for. And uh, it's something that is kind of hubristic when you look at the West and how we think that, hey, our way of doing things is the way that everyone else should want to do it. Although those places haven't gone through the societal changes to embrace what we're trying to force them into. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. And we can use democracy as, as an example. Most Americans believe that democracy is the the best system that exists. Some people will say it's the best worst system. Uh, another perspective, and, and this is going to, uh, let me preface this by saying that this is going to sound a little hoppian, and I am, I am not a hoppian. There's, there's significant issues I have with, with some of the uh, ideas that, that I, from my perspective, believe he proliferated. One of the things that he did say that I thought was interesting was he made an argument for, let's say, a benevolent dictator versus democracy. And the argument goes something like this. If you own a car, you own it, you're going to do lots of stuff to take care of it. You're going to get it oil changes. You're going to change the tires. You're going to be careful how you drive. You're not going to bang it up or any of that stuff because you own it. If you lease a car, you're probably going to push the limits of what you do with it because you know in three years you're not going to have it anymore. So your goal is to extract as much value out of that car that you're leasing while you have it in your possession because you don't actually own it. 
So the idea is that uh, in a monarchy, it's more like ownership, where uh, you have a legacy. If you take good care of your country and your people, then the idea is that the country will thrive. You'll have a legacy for your children and you pass that that country that you more or less own to your to your family. Uh, there is a strong incentive to do well. In a democracy where you know that you're going to be gone in four or eight years, chances are you're going to try to extract as much wealth as you can through uh, crony capitalism, through theft, through whatever you can get away with during those four to eight years, because you know that after that time is up, that's it. You're not going to be able to extract any more value out of this power that you have. It's funny, that's actually uh, an argument against the idea of term limits, because you're talking about renting versus owning. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And it's it's one of the huge flaws with our current system. I mean, every president that gets into office, their max term is eight years, or their max time in office is eight years. And there is no incentive to tackle the national debt. There's no incentive to tackle these big issues. It's just no, let, let the next guy do that. Let the next person do this. Like, I don't need to do this because somebody else will be here in five more years, you know, whatever it might be. Like Joe Biden, he's not going to tackle national debt. And then whoever gets in after him, whether it be uh, this year or in four years, they're not going to do anything about it. Unless, I mean, they're going to do what happened a year or two ago. They're going to say, well, let's refinance it a little bit. Let's uh, make it so it it's not a problem for five, six, seven more years. And that's it. That's all the incentive is. Whereas, yeah, if you had somebody who was going to be there for 20 years, like, and I'm not a fan of dictatorships. I don't think China is a great system by any means. I think there's uh, they're pretty authoritarian, but they have a lot of strategic advantages with having one person in charge for an extended period of time because they can look at things long term where we look at things pretty short term. Yeah, they, they get to play the long game. That's accurate. Yeah. You know, one thing that the other issue is most politicians spend much of their time working on getting reelected. So if you're in Congress, yeah. you're going to spend 20 hours a week fundraising. That's the job, not actually doing yeah. the job that you're there to do. Uh an idea that I like with, uh, at least when it comes to the executive, when it comes to the president, is maybe you don't have re-elections, but you have a longer term. So maybe instead of being able to hold office twice at four years a pop for between four and eight years, let's take away the incentive of trying to get re-elected, right? Because when you have that incentive, you're going to do stuff that you think is going to get you votes rather than what you believe is the best thing to do for the country. Yeah. If you had, let's say, a, a, a single six-year term with no possibility for getting reelected, six years instead of four or eight, during those six years, if, if one of your goals is to make the country better, you don't have this distraction of, well, what do I need to do in order to get votes in the next election? So your chances are you're going to work on the things that, that you believe in. So if you believe that we need to reduce our debt from 30, was it $34 trillion? Chances are you'll work towards that end if you know that you're not going to get elected again because it's something you care about and you're not distracted by what you have to do in order to get votes. Yeah, I like that you said six years and not an eight-year term because it would make sense. Like I, I would imagine about two years of that eight years for a president is consumed with trying Learning. to get reelected. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, without thinking about it too much, uh, having thought about it too deeply, I would generally probably support that. I think it would probably be a better system. So I think so too. The, the question is, how do you put that in the interests of the people who hold power? <laughs> yeah, That's right? the hard part. What are your thoughts about technology, like with the rise of AI? What do you think about AI potentially being that benevolent dictator at some point? 
the power is in the hands of the people who train the AI. Yeah. That's the reality, right? If you have, uh, I don't know, you, you have a, a hundred developers and, and 10,000 people who are pointing and clicking, there's going to be, there's going to be bias in the system. It, it's going to be there. Uh, I don't think you could ever eliminate bias from any system, even AI. I, I do like the idea of, of AI, um, being integrated into how we govern and the decisions we make. There are also things that scare the piss out of me. I'll give you an example. Uh, and this is an old one. Uh, are you familiar with Palantir? Palantir? No, I don't think okay. so. So Peter Thiel, right? One of oh, the founders yeah. of yeah. Uh, PayPal, one yeah. of his companies is Palantir. Well, Palantir has um, predictive policing technology. So they, uh, they used AI. This was a number of years ago to predict who in certain cities was likely to commit a crime. They actually tested that out in America. I mean, this is like, if you've uh, read or watched Minority Report, that's what it was. Yeah. So imagine living in a society where the AI using a statistical model says, you know what, uh, based on your behavior, it's very likely you're going to commit a crime, even though you haven't done one already. So I'm going to invade your privacy further. I'm going to watch you like a hawk. And uh, I'm going to create an environment where you probably will commit that crime because you're already accused of it. Like that, That's a dangerous thing. One of the things I struggle with it also is privacy. Right? So at heart, uh, I, I'm a libertarian. I, I believe in a right to privacy. You should be able to live your life however you want. You're not hurting people. I understand that if you if you don't have privacy, then you're able to get more inputs into the system. So where I live, there's cameras on every block and mm. th and they're feeding all of these inputs into the system. Uh, the state of New York, I assume, has all of my biometrics. And, you know, if, if crimes happen, there is a there's a record of it if they happen on the street. Right. At the same time, it's such a significant invasion of people's privacy. So how do you balance that out? How do you get the data that could potentially lead to, to good outcomes in a way that doesn't make it feel like an authoritarian regime? And, and I guess the, the authoritarian answer to that is, well, you just wait it out. So I, I'm a Gen Xer. You're, are you Gen X or millennial? Millennial. What's that? Millennial. Millennial, yeah. yeah. So probably uh, my generation and, and the older end of your generation uh, have experienced some level of privacy in our lives. Yeah. Uh, younger people don't even know what the concept of privacy is. And that, that's not a criticism. It's, it's a fact. Like We live our lives online now. We carry a device with us everywhere we go, which tracks all of our movements. When we you know, send emails or interact with social media or do any of the things we do, that information is going into a database somewhere. So culturally, we're already there where um, people are conditioned to not care about privacy very much. And so I, I think in 20 years, yeah, you know, where I live, there are cameras on every block. Uh, I think in 20 years, there's going to be there will be zero acreage where you can actually be in private, even to the extent that when you're in your home, it, you can you can use Wi-Fi signals to to track uh, people's movements inside of their own homes. Mm. Like, how yeah. crazy is that? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, interesting. I'm I'm 38, so I was 17, I believe, when 9/11 happened, and that was a turning point in privacy, in my opinion. Like Huge. we lost a lot of privacy, and then right after that, you had the rise of social media, which which just adds to that. Like there is barely any privacy anymore, and I always kind of cringe when I hear, "Well, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. I I don't need privacy. I don't have anything to hide." And the reality is, none of us know all the laws of our country. 
Like we don't know all the laws that all of these different agencies agencies have put into place. If you're a business owner, you're you have more risk of running into laws that you're not even familiar with because there's just more laws to govern your behavior. I'd imagine almost every adult in the United States breaks multiple laws every, every day. year. Yeah, 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 every day. Felonies every, every day. All of yeah. this. Yeah, there's a, a book I read. I think it's called Seven Felonies a Day or Three Felonies a Day by, I can't remember, the, Harvey Silvergate or something like that. But he basically touched on that. Like, There's all these laws that we're not even aware of. And there's new ones getting created all the time, which I'm actually pretty against. I don't think these three-letter agencies, these alphabet agencies, should be able to make laws. I think that's that's really supposed to be the power of Congress. I don't. I question whether it's actually was ever legal for them to delegate that authority to actually create laws to these agencies. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, in my perfect world, no surprise. I'd love it if there were zero three letter agencies. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, yeah, it's and again that goes to the argument that government should be as small as possible, and. Uh, certainly as localized as possible because the bigger it is, the more laws you have, there's no way that anybody could follow all of them. Now imagine if AI were tracking this and we're tracking every infraction, we'd all be in in the system within like a week, all of us. It's crazy. I like the idea of culture superseding law, right? If you have a good culture where uh, generally people are not causing harm to other people, right? Because that's what people believe, then you don't need as many laws. I don't know how we get there, but that's that's the ideal. What do you feel a leader is supposed to do? Does a leader create culture? It's a really good question. What does a leader do? Well, In a company, a leader creates an environment where people can thrive so that the company can thrive. That's my background, right? So, for example, I don't believe in uh, a command and control style of leadership. I, I like things like servant leadership. I like the idea of bringing a team together and giving everyone a chance to shine. So you're going to bring... The, the lowest person on the totem pole in and and give them an opportunity to to do to make their own decisions and to thrive and maybe they'll fail which is okay and maybe they will uh, do something amazing which is awesome but you're creating an environment where they feel safe to be able to try different things so in governance can you can you do that can you create an environment where people can live their own lives and try things knowing that they'll probably fail at some stuff. You know, they'll fall down, they'll get back up. Can you create that environment as a leader? I I think so. Um, I would say that, that that's, that's the main goal. Now, now does a good leader try to shift people in a direction that they feel is, is maybe better? Uh, yeah, I think so with, with, um, as little force as possible. So for example, you see somebody who's trying to finish a project and you know that if they just did one thing differently, they'll be able to finish it in a 10th of the time. Well, giving them that information is useful. So as a good leader, you'll probably want to convey that information to them share it in some way or ask them the right questions so that they come to the conclusion themselves and they use what you know is going to be a better method to solve a problem. So maybe a good leader politically is somebody who uh, who asks the right questions to get people to think and who shines a light on lots of different ideas so that people can make their own decisions based on as much information as is available. Uh, I think that's a good place to start. Okay. 
we didn't touch on uh, marketing too much, but I kind of want to tie marketing in there because I can you be an effective leader without good marketing? Mm. Yes and no. Uh, a leader doesn't have to be the face of an organization. A leader can be somebody behind the scenes. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I'm in a position where I'm not the face of a company, right? That's what the CEO does. But I might be in an operational position uh, as a marketer and as a team leader where I'm going to work with the people within a company in order to produce the outcomes that the CEO, through their vision, wants to see. So. I think that people are leaders in many different ways. And then if, if I'm leading a team, so to speak, again, I'm not a command and control style leader. I expect each of the people on my team to also be leaders in their own ways. Maybe they group into different cohorts. Maybe you're in a meeting where uh, you want to have an environment where people feel safe to speak up and to push back and to bring ideas to the table that are completely different than your own. Um, so, so I think that, that people can be leaders in many environments. Now, if you're talking about a, a president or somebody who wants to be president, yeah, that is a forward facing role. And, and I think the, the main objective there is to communicate your vision to people in a way that is persuasive enough for them to, to vote for you or to support your ideas. So yes, in that regard, you, you do need marketing and, and the marketing comes in a variety of ways. One is how do you get your message in front of as many people as possible who are relevant in your country or community or whatever. Uh, and another is how do you craft that message in a way that it resonates with people? So there's a lot of, of research involved. A, a good marketer is going to look at their, their tar target audiences and try to figure out what do these people care about? What's important to them emotionally? Yeah. And then how do I tie this, this idea to, to what they believe in and care about? And, and, and to be very forward, that's one of the challenges that a lot of libertarians have. We're very logical people very logical. Don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. Like that's, you know, that's liberty basically. <laughs> uh, but, but one of the challenges we have is, is being able to communicate with people who often lead with their emotions because that's human behavior. So one of the things that I think libertarians need to do a better job of is expressing more empathy in the way that they communicate. For example, uh, there's uh, uh, like, like, for example, Hornberger. OK, uh, Jacob Hornberger, he's he's one of the candidates running for president. And his message is uh, is very, very bold from a libertarian perspective. And one of the things he talks about is we need to end Social Security immediately. In principle, pretty much every libertarian agrees with that. It's a horrible system. The, the debate is over how you communicate that, because the way he communicates it, it feels like you want to pull the rug out from under people. Uh, it feels like, you know what, if this guy were president, he's just going to, to turn off Social Security and, and old people will die. Right? That's, mm -hmm. that's how uh, average people would react to that message. So then what happens? Well, those people talk about what the libertarian message is. Oh, libertarians want to end social security. And so now you've got 97, 98% of the population saying that libertarians are, are nuts, right? Because they, they don't dig into the nuance of what he's actually saying because he hasn't expressed the nuance of what he's actually saying. So in a case like that, I, I think that, that Jacob could potentially um, make that re message resonate with people better if, if you were to wrap it in a little more of, of the empathy stuff. You know, um, I, he, now to his credit, he does talk about, well, you know, there, there are communities and, and churches and families and those kinds of things. They exist. 
Um, I, I just feel like maybe maybe he wants to put a little more weight on that kind of thing if he wants his message to, to resonate with people. Um, and it wouldn't detract from what he's trying to say. Right? His, what, he, what he says, at least from the last debate that I saw, is that the other candidates are talking about reforming Social Security and reform is not a libertarian solution. Right? Again, I, I think there's a lot of truth to what he said. I just yeah. think that, you know, maybe it's not a reform message, but it could certainly be an empathic message that would create an environment where you don't have 98% of the people who hear your message putting other messages out there that are against everything that you say, because they've already put you in this crazy libertarian box. Well, that brings up a really important question, in my opinion, is, and it's relevant to me to some degree, is how do you market nuance? Because, I mean, if you're, let's say the abortion topic is is the thing, it, like, it's easy for conservatives to say abortion is murder, or uh, Democrats to say my body, my choice. They're catchy. It's 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 just easy to say that. It's a lot easier to say, well, we don't want to restrict women too much, but we also don't want late term abortion. You know, like it's very hard to market a nuance position. So, how do you market nuance? I don't think most people are wired for that. Mm. So if I go back to, uh, to Hornberger, who I think is a wonderful human being, his position is also, you know what, we're not, and if I say anything wrong, uh, you know, it'll be corrected. So my apologies if I misunderstood his message. Um, I believe what he is saying is that we're not going to convert anybody to become a libertarian. It's not going to happen. But what we want to do is draw out those people who already like our message so that they get involved in the movement. And, and I think that's what he's trying to achieve. So from his perspective, the, the nuance isn't as important. Uh, from my perspective, I think nuance is extremely important. The challenge is that, that human beings are not wired for nuance. So the mm. question is, how do you get a nuanced output where you have uh, binary inputs, so to speak, right? And, and I think the answer is what politicians are already doing. And it's, it's, it's a horrible thing, but it's the truth. So have you read Rules for Radicals? I have not, no. Okay, old book, far left book, yeah. with some brilliant ideas in it. And one of those ideas is that all you really need to do is anchor people to one thing that they believe in, and then they'll just go along with everything else you say. So the example from Rules for Radicals was, well, you know what? Everybody's against pollution, right? We want to live on a clean planet. So let's get people together who want to fight pollution, because that's a noble thing, and, and lots of people get behind that. But then once you get those people together, that's your community. Now you get to organize them about political pollution and everything else. You get to anchor every idea you want to uh, push forward to the central concept of pollution. And because they are emotionally tied to pollution and emotionally tied to being part of this community because it gives them purpose, they're going to go along with everything else you say. So from a practical standpoint, uh, a savvy politician, and again, I, I think this is horrible, but it's, it's how human minds work. Uh, a savvy politician would bring people in with an emotional argument so that they feel like they're part of the community that you're a part of. And then at that point, they introduce all the other ideas they want people to, to support. Uh, I think that's, that's what actually happens. I don't think that it's an easy thing to to get people to think differently. Now, what I will say is that a potential solution to get more humans to think from a perspective of nuance is to change the way that children are educated. So 
right now our, our public school system, which is based on the Prussian model, it was designed to make a bunch of uh, obedient factory workers. That's what the, mo- the model was designed for. So you go to class, you're there for 40 minutes, a bell rings, you get three minutes to get to the next class, another bell rings. You have all of these systems that are put in place to train you to be obedient and to make the widgets. Like that's, that's our school system. If we could change the way that we educate young people, where maybe critical thinking is, is part of the curriculum so that people can start to explore nuance and maybe even some emotional stuff, right? Some education in how to improve your emotional intelligence so that you can be a little bit more empathic and understand different perspectives when you approach a situation and communicate with people. If we could change our educational system, then yeah, I think there's there's a chance that a nuanced message would resonate with more people. Now, I don't think that we're going to be able to flip a switch and suddenly you're going to have, you know, fully privatized and, and homeschooled education. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but I think that if, if you could get the idea out there that, you know what, maybe maybe there's some stuff that young people should be learning that's that's more important than what they're learning today. Critical thinking, civics, finance, like these kinds of things, maybe we'll be in a better position. Our, our educational system is really antiquated. It, it needs to change. Now, one of the positive outcomes from the COVID lockdowns, which was a horrible thing that happened to all of us, uh, it did have some positive outcomes. And one of the positive outcomes was that kids were homeschooled and parents got together and they created these pods. They said, you know what, there's no way I, I'm going to be able to educate my kid for eight hours a day. But if I get together with three other parents and we can divide that responsibility and we can educate our kids the way that we want to. So I think that one of the positive outcomes of of the COVID lockdowns was that it opened more people up to the idea of of homeschooling and uh, a more voluntary system, which, which I think is good in many ways. You know, there's, there's certainly some uh, challenges. There's going to be some parents who are going to want to, you know, teach their kids stuff that most people would find um, outside of the realm of this reality that we live in. But for the most part, I think that it, it, it takes away a lot of the stigma associated with parents educating their own kids in some ways, decentralizing education. And then, and then to fill the gaps, you can certainly have, you can certainly have, Uh, specialty schools and specialty classes that can teach kids stuff that they're not going to be able to get from their parents. Uh, I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for the education system being completely revamped because it's, yeah, it's, it's built on the Prussian model originally meant to make obedient soldiers, then adapted to us to make obedient factory workers. And it's just, it just doesn't work. And I am, I, it didn't work for me at all. I was not fit for the Prussian model at all. It's too, uh, way too authoritarian for me. <laughs> yeah. But, well, you know, what's interesting is as a kid, my, the very early part of my life included what people would call homeschooling. And I think that helped me significantly. My, my older brother was, was luckier in that way. Uh, we were born in Vietnam. My mm. dad was in the Marine Corps. Met my mom over there. We lived there for like I think like seven years, something like that. And because my dad worked for the U.S. government, he had a uh, a government salary from the U.S. and and American dollars were worth a lot. So they were able to afford a, a tutor for my older brother. By the time he was seven years old, he knew three languages. He very intelligent, learned a bunch of stuff, was way ahead of other people his age. And um, and I think that worked very well for him. He went to an Ivy League school, all that stuff. For me, I had a little bit less of that. Came over here when I was about a year old. I want to say I was probably homeschooled until I, I entered kindergarten. So I knew a lot of stuff, maybe was a little bit further ahead than most other kids. 
uh, because culturally my, my parents put a lot of effort into that when we were growing up. Uh, and I think it helped me, not to the degree that it helped my brother because he had more of it, but it, it certainly helped me uh, to a degree. Uh, my younger brother didn't really have much of that. And, and so he had some problems in school growing up. Uh, and I think a big part of it had a lot to do with the diminishing attention that, that, that we got. And in most families, that younger kids get right the oldest kid often gets the most attention and then parents you know they do other stuff yeah. and then the younger kids get less attention or you look at uh culturally this is probably gonna get me in a lot of trouble so i'll be careful how i say it i love the idea that women can do all of the things that men can do and and that they can uh, work wherever they want and pursue whatever career goals they want it's it's an awesome thing it also has uh, some predictable economic uh, outcomes. One of those outcomes is that when you have more competition in the job market, uh, salaries stagnate. That's what actually happens. So you double the number of people in the job market. Companies have the upper hand. They can pay less. You also end up with uh, less attention for kids and and fragmenting families where, you know, if, if one parent is at home, father or mother, doesn't matter. If one parent is at home, the kids are going to get much more attention than if both parents are working. That's a fact. Yeah. So I, I think we also need to look at uh, both culturally and legislatively how the family has changed over the last however many decades. Um, and and what what the outcomes are have been and will be. We're at a point right now where the devices we carry are are now taking care of people's kids. So you go to any restaurant, you eat dinner. There's probably going to be a family there where there's a kid who's got like a tablet or something, and they're playing with it to keep them busy. Right? That's that's the kid's babysitter now. What's going to happen as AI? becomes more prominent in our lives. Uh, how is that going to affect the family? And how is it going to affect the way that, that people interact with each other on an emotional level? We already see it today where you have all of these young people who have, who have problems, right? Like whether it's, whether it's over diagnosis or it's real, um, you have a lot of kids who have like, you know, ADHD. You have a lot of kids who have trouble socializing. You have a lot of people who are on the spectrum. And I think a big part of that has to do with the changes in the family and, and the changes in how technology has, has become such a significant part of our lives. I love technology. I, I just think that we need to rethink how we utilize it and um the amount of time we spend on these things versus versus what we're doing now interacting with with other humans yeah i agree um dennis i can keep you here all day if you let me because i i am very much enjoying the conversation but i want to be respectful of your time and uh one thing i like to ask before i hand it over to you to you know, tell people how they can reach you and about your book. And you can feel free to include your book in this. I always like to ask people about books that they uh, that have influenced them in their lives. So uh, you mentioned Rules for Radicals. I actually do want to read that book. Uh, do you have any other books that have really influenced you? Yeah. So let me let me uh, first say that that Rules for Radicals didn't influence me, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. Uh, I just I just drew some important information from it, which was the idea that you can organize a community but around a single concept in order to drive action. I'm pretty basic. I like books like um, Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. I, I think that's awesome. I like, I like a lot of self-help stuff, uh, things that um, 
people can use in order to improve their lives. My book is called Back After Burnout. And uh, I wrote most of it. And there are chapters in there from a few other authors. Uh, and if you were to pick up a copy of Back After Burnout, it'll cost you three bucks in the uh, Kindle store and, you know, whatever it is for the paperback. You'll get a you'll get a glimpse into how I see the world. But more importantly, there's lots of information and activities that you can use to improve your own life. And I crafted this book around the idea of burnout. So the tools are in there with the intent that if if you feel like you're burning out or you've burned out and you need some help, it's going to help you figure out your purpose in life. It's going to help you figure out how to develop healthy habits that can make your life better. And it's going to help you get away from this idea of burnout and and feel more joy and purpose at, at work and other areas of your life. So, yeah, take a look at my book. If you like it, awesome. There are plenty of exercises in there. And if you explore them, you might find just one thing that helps your life. Oftentimes, I'll read a book and I'll get one thing out of it. So, for example, Rules for Radicals, I explained the one thing that I thought was extremely valuable in that book. If you get one thing out of Back After Burnout that improves your life in some small way, and in my, in my view, it's worth it. Awesome. Well, Dennis, uh, before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to let listeners know where they can find you on social media and your website if they want to work with you just and anything else you feel like sharing. I appreciate that. So the easiest way to find me is to Google me. Just Google Dennis Consorte. You'll find a bunch of stuff that comes up. And, and it helps me if you Google me too, because then it, it triggers different algorithms. So please do that. My website, just DennisConsorte.com, is the hub for where you can find a lot of other stuff. Different social media profiles I have on TikTok and Twitter and other places. And you'll even see some clips of me on different podcasts like this and, and different shows. I've been very fortunate lately. I've been on TMZ like every four or five weeks for the past uh, almost a year, I would say. So you'll see some clips on that, which are much more lighthearted than some of the deep topics that that we've covered here. But if you watch those clips, what you might find interesting is that in most of them, I'll try to inject a tiny bit of liberty into my message in a way that doesn't feel like me forcing libertarian ideas upon people. And I think the takeaway there is whatever you believe in, when you communicate with people, think about how you can inject just a little bit of your opinion into things without it feeling like you're preaching to people. And I think you'll find that it's a, a much more effective tactic than forcing your ideas down people's throats. I love it. I love it. Uh, Dennis, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I would gladly talk to you again in the future if you ever wanted. All right. My pleasure, Artie. This was great. Good chatting with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, Please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net, where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase, and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at RTM Podcast. That's A R T I E T M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.